If you find someone in your workplace doing something in the easiest, I'll say laziest way, you can say that they are cutting quarters. Now, we only use this phrase when someone is not doing the proper procedure or they're not doing something the way that they're supposed to be doing it. So it can be kind of an insult to someone to say, you're just cutting quarters. Or you can warn people that you want them to take their time and do things correctly by saying, we are not going to cut corners on this project. If you work somewhere where safety is important, like a factory, or you produce something, you know that it is so important not to cut corners when it comes to proper safety procedures. Well, we cut corners. Don't cut corners. Cutting corners. We're talking about cutting corners. If you are in a workplace and you're doing something for the first time, and you need someone to teach you exactly how to do it step by step, you're going to want to use the phrase, walk me through it. So when you say to someone, walk me through it, it means you need them to show you how to do it exactly. You need everything about the process you need explained. When it comes to computers, I know older people in the workplace often need a technical person to explain things step by step, especially if it's something that the person has never done before. If you want to tell someone that you're going to explain something to them or teach them how to do something, you can say, I will walk you through it. Or you could even add the two phrases together. I'll walk you through it step by step. Walking through my walk through it. Walk through Cougar Town. Walk me through this. This next English phrase is very important if you are going to criticize something or offer a suggestion to someone, but you do not want to come off as rude. You can use the phrase with all due respect to add politeness to your criticism or your suggestion. Now, if you're approaching someone who is your superior or your boss in the company or in your workplace, you can say, with all due respect, I do think there is a better way to get this done. This means you're not trying to criticize them or undermine them. You just, you feel like you have to suggest something and you are trying to be respectful by adding the phrase, with all due respect. Or if someone offers you a different suggestion or some criticism and you don't agree with it, you can say, with all due respect, I disagree. So this phrase is very useful when it comes to just trying to be polite in a more formal workplace. With all due respect. With all due respect. With all due respect. With all due respect. The phrase to put a pin in something means to postpone or pause a discussion about a certain topic. You will hear this all of the time in the corporate workplace. This phrase is especially essential for business meetings or business calls where there's lots of different people and there's an agenda for what needs to get done in a certain amount of time for the meeting. If something gets talked about way too much for way too long, you can say, let's put a pin in this and talk about it the next meeting. So maybe you're talking about things like a budget in a meeting and everyone's going on and on and on, you could say, let's put a pin in this and I will email everyone about it later. That means you're going to pause the conversation and email it later so that you don't waste too much time talking about this one subject. Let's do this, let's put a pin in it. Boop, pin in. Put a pin in that. Oh, uh, uh, forget, oh, uh, put, put a pin in it. Have you ever met someone who does everything by the book? If you are someone who does things by the book, it means that you follow every single rule and procedure and you are not a person who likes to break the rules. So by the book means by the rule book. Maybe you are someone who is more creative and you like to come up with your own ways of doing things. Even if that means breaking the rules a little bit, you can say, I don't always do things by the book. This is warning someone that you kind of break the rules or you do things out of order or differently than most people do. So this phrase is super useful, especially in the workplace when there are so many rules and procedures and correct ways to do things. By the book. Book. By the book, Sonny, from here on. In the business place, when you are making goals especially, it's important not just to look at the small details, but to look things more broadly. So the phrase you can use for this is to say, let's look at the big picture. So maybe you're in sales and for the quarter, the quarter of the year, 
Your sales numbers are down, but you could say, let's look at the big picture. For the year overall, we've had a pretty good profit or something like that. That means you're looking at more than just one quarter. You want to look more broadly at the whole year. Or maybe you want to warn someone that it's important not to just look at one customer or one project. Look at the big picture here. I'm starting to look at the big picture. Big picture, deputy. Look at it. To come up short. So when you fail to meet someone's expectations or you just don't reach your goal, even though you come close, you can say you came up short. So especially when we're talking about money and goals for making money for the year, if you don't quite reach your goal, you can say we came up short on our yearly income goal or profit goals. Or if you're just studying for a test or an exam and you don't quite get the grade or the score that you wanted, you can say, I came up short on the test. If we were to come up short, you are gonna come up short. Then coming up short. This next phrase, to hit the ground running, is really fun to use. When you are excited to begin a project or an activity, you can say, we are going to hit the ground running. And my guess for this phrase is it comes from the idea of soldiers or paratroopers jumping out of a plane and running to battle they're excited to get into battle they say they hit the ground running so they were running before they even started to hit the ground so if you are trying to motivate people in your workplace to finish a project you can say let's hit the ground running to finish this project in time that means just let's be enthusiastic and quick about the work that we're going to get done or if someone is new to a job, but it's a fast paced environment where they're going to have to learn a lot, you could say to them, you are just going to have to hit the ground running at this job. Hit the ground running. Really hit the ground running? Are you an outside the box thinker? The phrase to think outside of the box, it means that you come up with creative solutions to things. Oftentimes it's really valuable in the workplace to have someone on your team that can think outside of the box to come up with solutions to things. Because if we try the same methods to solve a problem, they don't always work. I think of people who have inventions as people who think outside of the box. I think of the person who invented the Dyson vacuum as someone who thought outside of the box because vacuums used to have just circular wheels and instead of a wheel, he put a ball so that the Dyson vacuum could turn all different ways. And fun fact for you, he was thinking outside of the box first for wheelbarrows, but he used the same technology of a ball to make a vacuum. And that was more successful than his first invention, the ball barrow, which looked like this. So if you want to be successful in inventing things or just coming up with solutions in the workplace, it's important to think outside the box, or as I said before, be an outside the box thinker. Think outside the box. Think outside the box. Uh, thinking outside the box, yeah. Now, speaking of problems, when you try to come up with a solution to a problem and it just doesn't work, you're gonna have to use this phrase, back to the drawing board. When you say, let's go back to the drawing board, it means let's start completely over at the beginning because our previous attempt was a failure or something that we tried did not work. So we need to come up with some new ideas again. Back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board. This next phrase is quite interesting. If you tell someone to have their ear to the ground, or you say, I'll have my ear to the ground, it means that you are going to be paying attention very closely to what is going on. And you're going to try to hear anything that people are talking about, not in a nosy way, but you're just paying attention because maybe you're working on a specific project that you need more information about. For instance, maybe you're wondering if your company is going to change a policy but your boss has not revealed to you if they are yet, you're going to have your ear to the ground and listen to other people in the workplace and see if you can figure out if the change is going to be made. I keep my ear to the ground. Well, keep your ear to the ground. Sing, let's have all units keep their ears to the ground. When you're talking about achieving a goal or you're making a deal with someone in business, 
and they change what needs to be done at the last minute, you can say that they are moving the goalposts. And this is so annoying when this happens. Let's say your company says you need to meet a certain marker in sales for the year and you're getting very close to reaching that and then they say, actually, we're gonna make that higher. They move the goalposts on you. That means instead of scoring or achieving your goal, they moved it up to make it more difficult. So this is just a phrase that we can use when we describe someone making it more difficult for you to meet a goal or be successful, even though you've been working hard towards a certain goal at the beginning. Really feels like you're moving the goalpost. This next phrase is very simple to use to say that somebody is quitting after many different attempts. You can say that someone is throwing in the towel. And this phrase is kind of like waving a white flag or, you know, quitting in boxing or another sport. You throw the towel into the ring. It just means you give up even though you've tried really hard. If you want to tell someone, even if they've been frustrated at trying to get something done and it's just not working, you want to tell them to not give up, you can say, well, don't throw in the towel just yet. So this phrase is really great. It's simple to use. Make sure to add it to your vocabulary. Don't throw in the towel. Yeah, by throwing in the towel. That's throwing in the towel. If you want to enthusiastically tell someone they are exactly correct about a problem or their guess for something, you can say you hit the nail on the head. So this phrase is super good to use in the workplace. It's just a really impactful phrase and it gets the point across like, you did a good job, you hit the nail on the head. Maybe your boss says, it seems like everybody is not able to get their work done because we have so many problems with our technology or our software. And you totally agree with that. You agree with their analysis of the problem. You can say, thank you. You really hit the nail on the head. It just means that you agree with them completely and their analysis or their summary of the problem was exactly correct. It's sort of a compliment to someone to say, you hit the nail on the head. Hit the nail on the head. Nick. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail right on the head. Have you ever heard of someone throwing a curveball? Well, in baseball, the sport, this would be when someone throws the ball and it turns at the last minute, making it very difficult to hit the ball. In life, we use this idiom to throw a curveball when someone changes the situation at the last minute and it completely throws you off or confuses you or makes a problem. If you want to warn someone that you are going to have to change something at the last minute and it might confuse them or cause a problem, you could say, I'm sorry to throw a curveball. This means, you know, I'm just, I'm sorry to change things and make it confusing. I can't throw a curveball. Life throws curveballs. To keep your cards close to your chest. When we use this phrase, it just means that we're not telling many people our exact plan or exactly what we're going to do. We're trying to be secretive when we use this phrase to keep your cards close to your chest. When you are negotiating a business deal, it's very essential to keep your cards close to your chest. You don't always want to tell someone, you know, we're willing to pay a lot of money for this. You want to try and see if you can meet at a fair price before you tell them the exact amount of money that you are budgeted to pay because maybe you could pay less. So keep your cards close to your chest. Use this phrase when you're being secretive in your business negotiations. You need to keep your cards close to your chest. Be playing your cards close to your chest. Have you ever thrown someone under the bus? I know when this phrase sounds terrible, but that's why it's an idiom in English. When you blame something on someone rather than taking accountability, you can say that you threw them under the bus. So maybe your whole team agrees that you are going to all take accountability, whether you do good or bad, and your team does really bad, but you say, hey, it was all Lisa's fault. She was the one slacking. You just threw Lisa under the bus. So you didn't want to take any blame or responsibility for your team doing bad. So you threw her under the bus, meaning you blamed all the bad things on her. So definitely don't do this phrase, but it is useful to know because it's such an extreme phrase to throw someone under the bus. It means to blame something on them for your personal gain. Whenever it's time to throw someone under a bus, 
throwing your husband under the bus. To open a can of worms. Have you heard of this English phrase? It's another very interesting one. So when you start talking about a complicated or problematic situation, and you know, you brought up the subject and now everyone has to talk about it and try to figure it out. You can say, I'm sorry, I opened a can of worms. This means that the topic is really complex and once you start talking about it, everyone has to just keep talking about it. You can't close the can of worms, which obviously it's not a real can, but that's why we use this expression because it describes the situation perfectly when you bring up a topic that now you have to talk about. So sometimes in meetings, when someone opens a can of worms, Everyone kind of dreads it because it makes the meeting last forever. Everyone has to share their opinion and argue about the topic. And at the end, you can just say, I'm so sorry I opened this can of worms. You opening up a can of worms. How would that open up a can of worms? This last phrase really makes me think of working on a boat, but you definitely don't have to work on a boat or ship to use this phrase. The phrase is all hands on deck. Now you might get an email in your English speaking workplace that says, this meeting is all hands on deck. This means that everybody in the company needs to be in the meeting. If you say, we need everybody all hands on deck for this project, we need everybody actually working very hard to finish this. Usually you will use this phrase if you need everyone to work on something that's super important or super urgent, you need all hands on deck. Hands on deck. All hands on deck. Another day, another dollar. This is such an American phrase because it really equates time with money. So a lot of times when we wake up and we don't want to go to work, we just say another day, another dollar. This means like, I just have to go to work today. I have to get my work done so that I can get paid. And once it's over with, it's over with and I'll be home. So you might hear American English speakers use this phrase, another day, another dollar. Another day, another dollar. I've got to get to work. Now, when you say this sentence, it really blends together. I've got to get to work. I've got to get to work. So practice saying it while you're listening to this lesson. I've got to get to work. This just means that you're running out of time. It's time to go to work. So you might be eating breakfast and having a nice conversation. And all of a sudden you say, oh, it's seven o'clock, I've gotta get to work. That means I need to leave now. A lot of times we use these expressions. We say, I'm running on time, I'm running early, or I'm running late. If you're on time, that means you're going to make it to your work or whatever your destination is at the exact time you need to be there. If you're running early, it means you have extra time. You will probably be at your destination or your work early. And if you're running late, this is the expression we use to say that we need to go fast because we are going to be late if we don't start moving. We're probably going to be past the expected time that we need to be there. Try not to run late because it is so stressful. When it's time to get lunch when you're at work, you might just say, let's go to lunch. That means let's take a break and maybe we're just eating lunch in our office location or we're going to get lunch, but it's just time for lunch. Let's go get lunch. Now, another verb that we use when we're talking about going to get food is we say, let's grab lunch together. You can use this for any meal, really. Let's grab a snack together. Let's grab breakfast together. This just means let's go get it together. It's just a very casual way to say, let's get some food. The next five sentences will help you talk about how busy you are during your day at work. If you want to say that you're having an easy day, you might say, today is light. My workload is light. That means there's not many things to do. This would be the opposite of having a heavy workload. Or you could say, today is a breeze. We call something a breeze when it's easy to do. So you could say, Getting a job is a breeze for me because I'm very qualified. That means it's easy for you to get any job because you have lots of qualifications. Maybe you have a lot of work experience 
or you have a lot of education that people really like when you are applying for jobs. When you want to say that you are busy with something, you can say you are tied up with it. A common sentence you might use is, I'm tied up with calls this afternoon. Or you might say, I'm tied up all afternoon. This means you're busy. When we say tied up, imagine like someone can't move because their arms are tied, but really they're not tied. They just have a lot of people to talk to or a lot of things to do, so they can't give attention to anyone else. If you want to say that your boss is busy, you could say they are tied up today. That means they cannot talk to anyone else. Another way to say that we have lots of things to do is we say we are up to our neck. We can say I am up to my neck in meetings today. This means I have so many meetings. Again, there's not room to do anything else for the day besides the scheduled meetings. If you want to say that you have been busy solving a lot of problems, you could use this sentence. You could say, I've put out a ton of fires today. It's like every problem in your work or your office is a fire and you are a firefighter and you have to pour water on them or solve the problem. So this is an idiom. To put out fires means to solve problems. Here are four phrases that would probably be pretty useful and common when you're talking about ending the workday. You can, of course, say, let's call it quits. This just means let's end the day. It's a really casual, common phrase. Let's call it quits. Or you can say, let's call it a day. That means that's the end of the day. We're going to call this the end of the day. But we just say, let's call it a day. And two really funny phrases that are also used quite frequently is you can say, Thank God it's Friday. T-G-I-F. This just means I'm happy that the weekend is here. It's the last work day of the week. Or if it's Wednesday, sometimes American English speakers say, happy hump day. Now, we think about a hump as a camel's hump or hill. And when we make it past Wednesday in the week, that means the rest of the week, there's only two days before the weekend. So the middle of the week we call hump day. And this is kind of a joking, casual phrase we use with our friends in English. Hump day for Wednesday. Let's talk about leaving work and some sentences that you might hear or you might need to use in English when leaving work and going about the rest of your day. So when we talk about traffic that does not move in major cities in the United States, of course, the traffic is terrible, just like major cities all around the world. We say we are in bumper to bumper. You could say, I'm in bumper to bumper traffic. That means there's so many cars that it's like they're in a parking lot and their bumpers are touching on the road. Sometimes when there's construction, there's always construction, and we have to take a different way because either the traffic is so bad or a road is closed, we take a different way to get home or to get to our destination than we usually do, we call that a detour. I have to take a detour. Or sometimes in English, if we have an unexpected stop on the way to somewhere we're driving, we say, I took a detour on the way here and picked up some ice cream. Something that's unexpected that you stop and do, we could sometimes call a detour. But normally we use this sentence, I have to take a detour when we have to go around traffic or we have to go around construction work on a road. I'm running a few errands on my way home. The word errands means tasks, things that you have to go in your car or go out of your house to do. You have to go get some things or you have to drop some things off. Like for instance, my errands usually are picking up groceries, dropping off mail or packages at the post office, and maybe grabbing a coffee, things like this. Just very simple tasks that you drive around in your car and do. It's called running errands. And if you need to get food from the grocery store, a common sentence you might use is, I'm picking up a few groceries. To pick up is a phrasal verb that means to get. I'm picking up a few groceries is the most casual and common way we say we're going to get food from the grocery store. If your car is running out of gasoline, we say I'm stopping to get gas. Or you can say I'm stopping for gas. That means you're stopping 
for gasoline in your car. You can say I'm getting gas or I'm running on empty or sometimes Americans will even say I'm running on E. I need to get gas. E stands for empty. When you look at your fuel gauge, you'll see the empty and in English, we like to say E for empty. And sometimes me personally, I'm always paranoid that I will run out of gas. So I get gas when I already have like a half a tank of gas. I just like to have a full fuel tank. It makes me really happy and satisfied. I will say I'm topping off the gas. So this means the gas isn't empty. It's actually probably half full or even more full, but I'm just going to get a little more while we're stopped. If you top off a drink, that means the drink isn't empty, but you're just filling the cup with more to the top. You're filling the gas tank to the top when you're topping it off. I'm grabbing a bite on my way home. This can either mean you're grabbing it to bring it home or you're stopping at a restaurant to eat some dinner. If you say, I'm picking up dinner, usually you're telling someone at home, maybe your husband or your wife, whoever, you're going to bring an already made dinner home from a restaurant. You're getting takeout. Sometimes my husband is on his way home from work. He will call me and he will say, have you made dinner or do you want me to pick up dinner? And sometimes if I haven't had time to cook, maybe the day has just been very busy, I'll say, yes, please pick up dinner. That means please buy dinner from a restaurant and bring it home. And when you're deciding what is for dinner, you could say what's for dinner, of course. But you can also ask someone questions like, what about Chinese? Or how does Chinese sound? This means how does Chinese food sound? We can replace Chinese with how does Italian sound? How does Mexican sound? How does Ethiopian sound? Any type of food we like to say in the United States, how does it sound? That means do you like it? Does it sound good to you for dinner right now? If you have something that you really like and you want to eat for dinner, you can suggest it by saying, I could go for pizza or I could go for Italian, or I could go for Mongolian, whatever type of food it is. If you say, I could go for it, it means you would like to eat it. It sounds very appetizing to you. Let's talk about some activities you might do when you get home from work. You might say, I'm going to go for a run. Go for a run means you're going to go out running. Or you can say, I'm going to take a stroll. The phrase to take a stroll means to go for a nice leisurely walk just for enjoyment and exercise. If you want to watch a movie, you might say, let's turn on a movie. That means let's start a movie. And if you're like me, I've got to pick up the house before I go to bed. This means I need to clean everything and put everything back where it goes. I like when the dishes are done. I like when the laundry is done. I like when all the toys are put away. Things like that mean to pick up the house. When I need to do some laundry, I say, I'm going to run a load of laundry. This means I'm going to start by washing the clothes and then putting them in the dryer. To run a load of laundry means to clean your clothes and to dry them. And when you have dishes in the United States, we commonly have dishwashers in our kitchen and we say we're going to load the dishwasher. So that means we're going to take the dishes that we use for dinner or whatever meal and we're going to put them in the dishwasher. We say we're going to load the dishwasher. Another common chore is taking out the trash. I've got to take out the trash. One day a week, the trash truck comes to my house and picks up my trash can and then puts it back and drives away. So I have to take out the trash the night before. That means I have to put the trash can on the curb so that the trash truck can take the trash. When your jobs are finally done for the day, it's time to go to bed. You might say, I'm headed to bed. This just means you're gonna go to your bedroom, you're gonna start getting ready for bed, you're gonna brush your teeth, and then you're gonna go to sleep. You're just giving a warning, I'm headed to bed. You're tired. Or sometimes we use this idiom, we say, I'm going to hit the hay. This means I'm going to go to sleep. If you feel tired, you might say, I am tuckered out or I'm tired out. These both mean the same thing. They just mean very tired. What I always like to say is it's past my bedtime. Even though I'm an adult, I don't have parents that are telling me to go to bed. 
I like to kind of joke and say, well, it's past my bedtime. I'm very tired if I'm up late ever. One thing that I am definitely guilty of is scrolling social media before I go to sleep. So I might say, I'm going to scroll social media for a few minutes. That just means I'm going to look at all the social media apps on my phone. We call that scrolling. It means you're just looking to see what's going on on social media. And what I tell my kids every night is good night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. But don't worry, I don't have bed bugs. This is just a really common way to say good night in a cute way in the United States. So if you hear an English speaker in the United States say, don't let the bed bugs bite, there's no bed bugs. Hopefully there's no bed bugs. It's just like a cute thing that we say to one another. Do you have any phrases like this in your first language? Let me know in the comments because I think this one is super funny. First, you should say, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes or no? If they can't hear you okay, they might not be able to answer, obviously. Another very common phrase you'll definitely hear on the phone if the person can't hear you very well in English is you're breaking up. This means your voice is breaking up. I can't hear it all the way. Or if you want to tell someone that you can't hear them very well, maybe you can only hear every other word, you can say you're breaking up. If you want to warn someone that your phone call might not be very stable because, you know, you're in a very remote area, you're in the country, or maybe you're somewhere where there's not very good cell phone coverage. We commonly say, sorry, I have bad service. I might break up a little, or you could say I have bad service. Let me know if you can't hear me. And this just means you have bad cell phone service. When I'm on the phone with someone and they're traveling, especially, you know, if they're staying in a hotel, oftentimes they'll be talking on the phone. I will start to not be able to hear them. They'll say, I'm in an elevator. I'm in an elevator. Oftentimes, you know, when you're inside of an elevator, the cell phone is not able to reach the cell phone towers and get good service. So this is another good warning that you'll want to know when you're speaking English on the phone. If you can't hear someone, you know, very well, or maybe you just didn't quite understand every single word that they said on the phone, we often say, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? And another common phrase that goes right along with, can you repeat that is, sorry, I didn't catch that. That means I didn't hear it completely or I didn't quite understand it. And it tells the person that you're talking to that you need them to repeat it. Here are some great phrases that you will commonly hear at the beginning of a phone call in English. Whether you're speaking to a familiar friend or relative, these phrases are pretty casual and you can always use them at the beginning of your phone call. When my family calls one another, we always say, hey, what's going on? That means what's the reason that you called? It's a really common way to start the phone call. What's going on? And sometimes I'll call someone and I will say, hey, what's going on? Or someone will call me and say, hey, what's going on? That usually just means that you want to hear what they're doing with their day. You know, you want to hear how they're feeling, how their family is. It's just a very general way to start a casual conversation on the phone. The most common way that I answer the question, what's going on, when I'm not doing a lot or I don't have a lot of time to talk on the phone is I'll just say nothing much. What's up with you? This just means, you know, how are you? But what's the reason that you're calling as well? This is a good way in a casual phone call just to get to the point of the conversation. When you call someone like your mother or your grandmother or your dad or your grandfather, oftentimes, you know, you don't have a very specific reason that you're calling. You're just calling to be nice and you want to make sure that they're healthy, they're happy, they don't need anything. There are three ways that you can say this on the phone in English. You can say, I'm just calling to catch up. To catch up with someone means just to talk about your life and how you've been recently, how they've been recently. Again, talking about their health or their kids or whatever. It's just a very general, casual conversation. Sometimes I just say, I'm just calling to check in. When you check in with someone, again, it's just making sure that everything is okay or i'm just telling you that you know everything is going well with me just going over what's going on that day and another phrase that you can use 
to just make sure that you're giving a nice, kind phone call with you know, no true reason is I'm just calling to check up on you. If you check up on someone, you make sure that they're doing okay. So these three phrases are all very good to use just for calling someone casually to make sure that they are doing well. Two phrases that can really help you start the conversation on the phone, especially maybe if you don't know the person that well or you don't, you don't normally talk on the phone, you might feel a little nervous, is you can say, what have you been up to lately? I think this is a really nice phrase because, you know, it makes you sound interested in what they've been doing and it makes it so you sound like you're a friend, you know, what have you been up to lately? I want to know how you've been doing. Or you can even say, what's new? And this phrase is really useful on the phone or it's useful in person in a conversation as well. Just to say, hey, what's new? This just means, you know, what's been going on in your life? Usually you're asking for positive news. But sometimes people will say, you know, oh, I've had someone sick in my family or they'll tell you something unfortunate or bad that has happened. These are two really friendly, polite ways to start the conversation on the phone. Another reason that people call you is maybe they'll say, I've got a favor to ask or I've got a favor. People will say, I've got a favor to ask just, you know, to be polite, to warn you that they're going to ask you for something. But this is considered very polite way to ask for a favor. I've got a favor to ask. And you say, shoot. Shoot means go ahead. Or you can respond with the phrase, I'm all ears. My English students notice that Americans love to say totally as well. Totally just means for sure. Yes, of course. So these phrases, shoot, I'm all ears, or totally just means you're enthusiastically saying yes, Go ahead, tell me the favor, I'm happy to help. They're very polite in a casual, friendly conversation. One of the most common reasons for calling someone on the phone has to be to make plans. So here are some great phrases that you will need to know if you're calling someone to make plans or someone calls you to try to, you know, make plans. So again, just like the beginning of our conversation, sometimes we say, hey, what are you up to? Or what are you up to right now? These phrases are just inquiring if you are busy or not. It might sound more like a general greeting, but when people say, hey, what are you up to on the phone? It's trying to figure out if you're busy or not. Another question, if someone is making plans with you on the phone, maybe they want to go to the movies, to a restaurant, or maybe they just you know want to come over to your house, you can ask them, what time did you have in mind? That means, what time works best for you or what time were you planning on? It's a great way that people ask, you know, what time works? What time were you thinking of? Sometimes people won't just say, what time did you have in mind? People will say, hey, what time were you thinking? And this means the exact same thing, like what time works? What time did you plan on? Another phrase that's very important for making plans and talking about the time is when do you want to meet up? Whether you're meeting at someone's house, a restaurant, or going to a park, you want to know what time do you want to be there to see me? What time do you want to meet up? And a really, really common question that you will hear in the United States is your place or mine? Now, make sure if you say this, you're not being too assumptive that the person would allow you to come over or the person would want to come to your house, you typically want to know someone pretty well before you go to where they live. But you'll just hear this question when making plans. If you guys are planning on going to someone's house, you could say, hey, your place or mine. Someone could say, do you want to have dinner with me on Tuesday? And if you want to offer, you know, you could come to my place or I could come to yours. You could say, oh yeah, your place or mine. I would consider this question very polite because you are also offering to have the person to your house and not just assuming that they are inviting you over. Or if you have a good friend that you hang out with quite frequently and they say, hey, like, we should hang out this weekend. You could say, yeah, your place or mine. So it's just a very common way to make plans with this phrase. So especially if you're planning a date or you're planning on hanging out with someone for the first time, it can be kind of, you know, awkward at first, like, oh, I don't know exactly what place you're talking about, or uh, I don't know your home address. So here are some questions that can help you figure out where you should meet the person that you're making plans with. You can say, could you tell me the address? 
And this can be used in a formal or informal casual conversation. Sometimes I just say, can you text me the details? Because I don't have a paper and pen and it's hard out of the phone to, you know, write it down real quick. But everybody texts nowadays, so I just say, hey, text me the details. So this just means, you know, text me where we're meeting, when we're meeting, whatever I need to know. Or the other day I went to a comedy show with my husband and my brother and my sister-in-law. And my brother had this all planned out and he just said, I'll send you the details. So he sent me, you know, on a text message where I needed to be, when I needed to be, what restaurant we were going to meet at. It was super fun and it was so nice because he said, I'll just send you the details. That means don't worry about, you know, where we're going or trying to find it. I'll, I'll text to you. You don't have to write anything down. So the details would just be the location and the time for the most part. So many places in the United States, we don't have buses or subways or trains, you know, it's very common to drive somewhere. You know, there's so many cars and everyone has to drive in the United States. So a very common question you'll hear if you're making plans on the phone is, do you want me to pick you up? This means you want me to drive to your house to come get you and give you a ride. It's a really polite way, you know, to offer to drive. Or if you want to make sure that the person has a car and you're unsure if they do, you could say, hey, how are you getting there? And they might say, I'm driving, or actually, I do need a ride. If you're going to a party and you get kind of nervous and awkward, like myself, you may want to know who's going to be there. So if somebody invites you to go to a dinner or whatever it is, you can say, hey, who's going to be there? This just means tell me all the people because I need to make sure that I know them. Or maybe you don't want a certain person to be there if you're going to go. So this is a very important question as well. I am one of those people that is always hungry. I'm always thinking about what's for dinner. And if I'm making plans with someone on the phone, I always say, have you eaten yet? That means, you know, are you hungry? Basically, it's it's a very polite way to ask, like, do you want to go get some food? Hey, have you eaten yet? And maybe you're going to meet up with them in a little and they say, no, I actually haven't eaten. And say, oh, well, let's go get some food. Or you can use this phrase, let's grab a bite. The phrase, let's grab a bite, is just a slang phrase that means let's go to a restaurant and let's get food together. And typically we say a bite, this phrase, when we're going to just a very casual restaurant. You wouldn't be going to a fancy dinner and be like, we are going to grab a bite tonight. No, this phrase is strictly casual. Let's grab a bite. Here in the United States, at least in big cities, there are so many options for restaurants because the United States truly is a melting pot and there's a lot of different immigrant communities here that bring different types of food in here. And so you might ask someone, what do you think about Chinese? Or what do you think about Vietnamese? Or what do you think about Mexican? Now, this might sound a little strange, but when you ask this question, you're typically talking about food. like. What do you think about these types of food? Would you be interested in going to eat these types of food with me? So if someone says, you know, what do you think about Mexican? They're not talking about what do you think about Mexican people? They're talking about what do you think about Mexican food? Because people have different preferences and you might be asking like, do you want to go get it with me? And again, if you're trying to be polite and you're trying to make sure that the person has a way to get to where you are going and say, do you need a ride? This means that you're driving or, you know, someone you're with is driving and you can pick them up or you can say, hey, I'll drive. So it's a friendly way to say, I can drive my car. This question is probably more common amongst females, but men can ask this too because it's important that you fit in where you're going and, you know, if you're supposed to dress fancy or casual, you should say, what should I wear? And the person might answer, oh, sorry, this restaurant is really fancy. Definitely wear something nice. Or what should I wear? Oh, you can just wear jeans. It's, it's not that fancy. Here are my favorite three phrases for, you know, ending the phone call, just being happy about the plans. I'll say, well, it's a plan. This just means like, yep, we've got it ready to go. I'll see you then. Or you can say it's a date. You can even say this to just your friend. It doesn't have to be an actual romantic date that you're going on with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I will say this all the time to my friend when we make plans. Oh, it's a date. That just means it's a solid plan. It's exciting as a date. Or you can just say, I can't wait. 
This just means you're excited. The plan is ready. I'll see you then. Now that we have reviewed some phrases that will help you make plans with a friend in a more casual phone call, these phrases will help you when you're on the phone with someone making an appointment. You could be making a doctor's appointment, dentist's appointment, an appointment to go see you know, a professional lawyer or accountant, whoever you need to make an appointment with. The conversation is going to be more formal, definitely if you're calling a business. So let's review these phrases. So I'm definitely one of those people who, you know, gets a little nervous to call and make an appointment. So I always like to think about when they answer what I'm going to say. And if English isn't your first language, it can also be a little nerve wracking. It can make you nervous to call and make an appointment. So always just get in your mind what you're going to say when they answer. So you might call and they answer the phone like, hi, how can I help you? And you can say, I need to make an appointment. Or I sometimes say, hi, I'm calling to schedule an appointment. This is a really common way to say, I just need to schedule an appointment. I'm calling to schedule an appointment. Remember that phrase? so that when someone answers the phone, you are ready to speak and schedule that appointment. Now, if someone answers the phone and you know they say, okay, when do you want the appointment? They'll actually just say, hey, what times work best for you? And this is just like asking you, does morning, afternoon, whatever work best for you? Give them a time range because it can be so hard to find a time to schedule an appointment, especially, especially if it's a doctor's appointment. I find it really hard to find a time that works for my schedule. A phrase that also is really common is, okay, when are you free? Or when are they free? This is asking when their schedule is available. Sometimes if there are very limited appointments, whoever you're calling might just say, okay, how about Tuesday at 1.30? Does that work with your schedule? So this question just means, is it going to fit into your schedule? Are you going to be available then? Does that work with your schedule? A really common phrase in business English is I can pencil you in. If you pencil in someone, it means that there's not a lot of time for an appointment or a meeting, but they will be able to fit you in. On the telephone with a business or a doctor's office, they'll ask you to confirm information. So they'll say, can you confirm your date of birth? They're asking for your birthday. It's a really, really formal way to ask for this. Or they'll say, can you confirm your current address? This means, can you tell me where you live? Now you can also use this question as well. I always do this on the phone because I am the worst at writing down information correctly. I'll say, can you confirm the appointment time again? So they'll say, yes, it's at Tuesday at 1.30 and I'll make sure that I have it correctly. Or I'll say, hey, just to confirm the appointment on Tuesday at 1.30, and they'll say, yes, that's correct. Or sorry, no, I said Wednesday. And I'll be like, <sighs> if someone gives you an appointment time and it doesn't work, you can say, do you have anything available the next week? Or do you have anything available on a Friday? Do you have anything available on? So you're asking for a specific day or if you're asking for a specific month, you could say, do you have anything available in February, in January, whatever it is. And then if somebody has a time for you that doesn't quite work, you can say, do you have anything available earlier? Or do you have anything available later? And again, if you're like me and you just want to make sure that you have the correct information, you can say, I just want to clarify the time or the date. Or if you have an appointment and you're calling an office or business and you want to make sure that you have the correct time and date, you can just call them and say that, hey, I just want to confirm the time and date of my appointment. So now that we've talked about all these ways that you'll be speaking on the phone to people and really common phrases, let's talk about how you're going to end the phone call without being awkward. A great phrase that works either in a formal or informal conversation is to say, okay, take care. This is a very kind salutation, a way to say goodbye in a phone call. Hey, take care. If you are in an informal, casual conversation with a friend, you will say, have a good one. Have a good one is a really common phrase on the phone and in real life conversation to say, have a good day. Now, if you're in a formal conversation, like scheduling an appointment on the phone, you'll want to say, have a good day or have a great day. 
Both are totally acceptable and very friendly. And if you're in the South of the United States, a really common phrase is to say, have a blessed day. You know, it always kind of makes me laugh because I'm not from the South. When someone says that to me on the phone, just because I'm not used to it. Have a blessed day. Another way if someone has helped you on the phone is you end the conversation with saying, thanks again, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again is just another way to express your gratitude, just to say that this conversation on the phone was helpful. Thanks again. In a formal conversation on the phone, someone might say to you, thanks for calling. Or you could say thanks for calling to someone as well. And the last three phrases I have for you are more for your casual, friendly conversations. A really cool way to say goodbye is to say, hey, take it easy. Take it easy just means, you know, have a good day, relax, take it easy. Take it easy literally means don't work too hard. But it's just used all the time in casual conversation to be friendly. I just think it's a very cool way to say goodbye. Take it easy. Or if you just made plans with someone and you're going to see them that day, or just maybe very nearby in the future, you can say talk to you soon or see you soon if you're actually going to see them. And if you're talking to someone that you don't talk to a lot, you can say, all right, keep in touch. This just means call me back again. I enjoyed talking to you. Keep in touch. Let's first start with some formal phrases for professional communication. When you meet someone, of course, you want to say, good morning, and you'll say their name. So let's pretend we're talking to Joe. Good morning, Joe. How are you today? Good morning, William. How are you? And... Only when you're in a formal situation, I want you to say, it's a pleasure to meet you. Instead of saying, nice to meet you, or, oh, it's good to meet you, let's say, it's a pleasure to meet you. If you are speaking to many people at one time, and you want to say your name, say, allow me to introduce myself. Allow me to introduce myself. This is just a great icebreaker, a way to start by introducing yourself. It lets the audience or the people that you're talking to know that you need to say your name and maybe you'll say your job title or something about yourself. Allow me to introduce myself. When you are trying to be polite, it's super important to express your gratitude or thankfulness. When we're speaking in written text over email and you want to say that you're happy that someone responded very quickly, you can say, I appreciate your prompt response. I say this all the time because I really do like it and appreciate it when people respond to email messages very quickly, especially if I have a request or a question. Sometimes if you send someone an idea or something that you want to happen, you can close your email or end your email by saying, thank you for considering my proposal. Thank you for considering my proposal. Or if someone responds to you about your idea, you can just say, thank you for considering my proposal. I will wait to hear back from you. This phrase, thank you for considering my proposal, it just means thanks for your time, thanks for thinking about it. And you can either thank them in advance or thank them after they consider it. If you want to say formally that you are happy that someone helped you, you can say, I appreciate your assistance. Appreciate your assistance. This is a great formal phrase. In English, it's really important to make sure that someone isn't busy or make sure that they have time to help you before you ask for help or before you assume that they can help you. A great phrase to use for this is, may I have a moment of your time? May I have a moment? If someone has been very supportive or helpful and you want to thank them, you can say, I would like to express my gratitude for your support. This phrase is really helpful if someone has been very helpful or supportive to you. You know, they've backed you up. They have supported your ideas. They've spoken highly of you to other people. You can say, I'd like to express my gratitude for your support. And this is a really awesome formal phrase to say this. When you get onto a new work team or you're starting to work with some new people or you're beginning a new project with people that you haven't worked for, you can say, I'm delighted to be working with such a talented team. I'm delighted. So this is a really formal compliment that you can give to a group of people that you're going to be working with. Again, in real life or over email, the phrase, please let me know if there's anything I can assist you with. Please let me know if there's anything that I can do to help. 
this is a great phrase to just offer up your help and assistance. Let's talk about some informal phrases for rapport building. Now, when you build rapport, it means you build a relationship and trust with other people. And this is super important in the office. And it's the reason why that you need to learn informal English as well as formal English. When you are able to talk to someone like they're more of a friend than a work colleague, it does build trust with the other person. A more informal way that you can say hi is to say, hi, how's it going? I'm How are you? How's it going? There, oh, it's a nice great. handshake. Thanks. If you are just trying to build a relationship and not be so formal and professional. A great way that I like to suggest to all my English learners to see someone that they've seen again is to say, nice to see you again. It's nice to see you again, Ivan. This phrase just built on the fact that you have met this person before. Did you have a good weekend? Did you have a good weekend? Always important to ask people about their weekend and a little bit about their personal life when you work with them. A nice compliment that you can give someone on your work team is you can say, you bring a lot to the team that you bring a lot of very valuable intangibles. This is just a way of complimenting their work and their skills. Another thing in English that we like to say to one another is you are so positive. Are you positive? Yes, very positive. This is just complimenting their attitude and their positivity and happiness. I want to tell you how much I enjoyed working on this project together. I enjoyed working alongside you. This is a much more informal way of just telling someone that you like working with them and hopefully you want to work with them more in the future. You are really moving the needle. This is a really cool phrase that just means that the person is really making progress. Maybe they're doing new things that nobody has done before in your workplace, or maybe they're just getting a ton done. They're moving the needle. It's like they're making progress. I couldn't ask for a better teammate. This is an extremely nice compliment to give to someone at your workplace. You can even say, I couldn't ask for a better coworker. What do you think about grabbing lunch sometime this week? I always talk about how in English we say grab lunch, grab breakfast, grab dinner. This means go get a meal with another person. So if you ask someone, what do you think about this? This means like, would you want to do it with me? I'm looking forward to working with you more. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Conrad. This phrase could be used when you first meet someone and you just want to say, you know, pleasantly that you are excited to work together. You're hoping this relationship is good and positive and you're happy to be working with this person. Let's move on to the next set of phrases that are for navigating meetings and presentations. So these will be a bit more formal as well. A great way to start a presentation in the afternoon is just to say, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon. This is just showing your gratitude that everyone is listening and you have their attention and their time. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge everyone's hard work. Before we begin. This is a compliment to the people that you work with and you're just taking the time to make everyone feel good and let them know that you have seen them working hard. This is a great phrase, especially if you are a leader or a boss. When you want to add on or add you know a comment onto what someone else has said in a meeting let's pretend like we're talking about what joe said you can say i'd like to add on to what joe said earlier this is the most common way that you can you know talk about an idea that relates to something that someone else has said in the meeting i'd like to add on to what joe said earlier if you want to agree with someone remember it's always important to use another individual's name you can say I completely agree with your perspective, Joe. I completely agree. And this is just agreeing with their idea and the way that they see things. If you want to thank someone for saying something in the meeting that was important, you can say, thank you so much for bringing that to our attention, Joe. Oh, thank you so much. If you want someone to explain what they're talking about a bit more in a meeting, you can say, can you elaborate on that point a bit more for me? And to elaborate means to expand or talk about or explain some more. And when you really don't understand what someone is talking about or how they got the idea that they're speaking about, a formal way that you can say, you know, can you, can you explain that is to say, can you show us how you reached your conclusion? Could you show us, please? 
when someone shares a really valuable opinion in a meeting, you can tell them, I appreciate your input. Let's explore that further. So someone's input is their opinion. So I appreciate your input. I appreciate or I like that you're telling me how you feel about whatever's going on in the meeting or in the company. Let's take a moment to review the key points. Let's take a moment. So the key points would be the main ideas or whatever you have talked about that's really important in the meeting. The key points. If there are no further comments, let's move on to the next agenda item. If there are no further questions. So oftentimes in the workplace, when you have a meeting, you have an agenda or a list of things that you need to talk about or decide. And so often when you want to keep the meeting moving, you'll use this phrase, if there are no other comments. That means like nobody else has anything left to say. You need to move on. In conclusion, I believe that this approach will lead to success. So when you're ending the meeting, the most formal way is to say in conclusion, or if you're ending a talk that you're giving and you know you just wanna summarize everything and say like this work, I believe that this approach or your idea will lead to success. Let's talk about how we can master formal written communication and still be super polite. If you are emailing someone for the first time, you can say, Dear Joe, I hope this email finds you well. And if someone answers a question very quickly, you can say, Thank you for your prompt response to my inquiry. And inquiry is a formal word for a question. If you have talked to someone and now you're going to email them about what you talked about, you can say, I wanted to follow up to our recent conversation. I wanted to follow them. And oftentimes in the workplace, you need to attach or send a document with an email, especially if someone requests it. So you can say, here is the document you requested. It is attached. Or you can say, please see the attached. This just is bringing attention to the fact that you attach a document to the email. A great way to end an email where you have sent some thoughts or ideas to someone is you can say, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the matter. This just means that you are eager to hear their opinion. If you want to compliment someone for, you know, seeing a mistake or seeing something that was missed, you can use the phrase, your attention to detail is much appreciated. May I have your attention, please? If you think that someone was confused or they say, you know, what's going on with this? You can say, I apologize for the confusion let me clarify. This means, you know, to clarify means to make more clear or to make someone understand. Let me clarify the situation. What you when you want to make sure that someone is not hesitant or, you know, scared to ask questions about something and you want to provide the best customer service or just, you know, the best relationship possible, you can say, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. And I often say this at the end of my emails just to make someone know that I am available to answer any questions. If you have any further questions, feel free to call. Thanks. In English, we oftentimes use best regards at the end of an email before our name, before a signature. And some people even just say best. Best regards, Kayla, or best Kayla. Best regards, Eric. If you want to begin a message with just a nice pleasantry, you can say, I trust this message finds you well. This means I hope that you are doing well. Let's talk about some great English phrases that you can use to wrap up a conversation in the workplace. And remember, we are going for polite phrases that you can actually use with the people you work for. You can just use the phrase to sum up our conversation today. You could say, let's reflect on what we've covered. This means, you know, let's think about, let's speak about what we've talked about already today. I encourage everyone to share their thoughts before we conclude. This means that you are asking everyone to share or say their opinions on something before you end the meeting or the conversation. Thank you all for your active participation. Thank you all very much. This is when you want to thank everyone for actually speaking and being present and participating in a meeting. As we move forward, let's keep these key points in mind. That means just remember what I've talked about. Don't forget these very important ideas as we keep going in the discussion. 
So that phrase, key points, remember that means important things or important ideas. I encourage you all to apply these concepts to your daily interactions. This is a really formal way to just say like, actually take what we've talked about and use them in your everyday workplace life or your actual job. Don't just forget everything we talked about in the meeting. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or need any clarifications. Feel free to use it and know that it's clean because this is another really polite, nice and formal way to say, you know, I am available for questions. Feel comfortable asking me because I really want you to understand. So feel free to reach out. To reach out would be just to talk to me or to email me. Keep up the fantastic work. Your daughter is doing fantastic work. This would be a nice way to tell everyone they're doing a really good job in your workplace. I'm confident that our teamwork will lead to success. And finally, when you want to, you know, just close out what you've sent to someone, you're looking forward to working with them more, you can say, I'm looking forward to our continued collaboration. And this would be great in a face-to-face -face meeting, a Zoom meeting, or an email if you said this to someone. I'm looking forward to our continued collaboration. You'll hear Americans say, let's get you up to speed. This idiom, up to speed, it means that they will give you information that will help you be with the rest of the company or the rest of the team that you're working with. So if you are in sales, maybe they'll educate you on a product, or if you work more with technology, they'll let you know what they've been working on and the progress that they made. They'll get you up to speed. This is the natural way to say that they'll teach you what you need to know. This next phrase is really used in American corporations. They'll say that they have something in the pipeline. If they have something in the pipeline, it means that they have something that's going to come up soon. So if there is a project that's in the pipeline, it means it's not finished or complete yet, but it's, it's getting there. It's being worked on as we speak right now. So instead of saying that we have something coming up, or we have something that we're working on, American speakers will say, we have something in the pipeline. And I like to think of this phrase like an oil pipeline, like it's moving along. This phrase is used in quite the opposite way. If we're going to stop something or quit something in the workplace, we'll say we're going to pull the plug on it. So instead of saying we are going to stop the project, maybe there's a project in your company that's losing a lot of money, We'll just say, we're going to pull the plug on that. It's quite a harsh phrase to say, you're going to pull the plug on something. It literally means you're going to stop giving it power. So if you hear an American say that we're going to pull the plug on something, it means we're going to stop it, we're gonna quit it, we're going to stop putting energy into it. I always like to say that when you are at a new job, you feel kind of nervous at first, you really feel like you don't know exactly what you're doing but after a while, you will get the hang of it. This idiom is the most common way that I hear speakers say that you will get the skills needed to be good at something. So maybe speaking English at first was difficult for you, but you're really getting the hang of it. This just means that you're getting the skills developed. You're getting good at something. When I hear Americans in the workplace say that they have described something enough, and they think that you understand it because they've been talking about it for long enough, they'll just say, and you get the picture. So if you tell someone that they get the picture, it means they understand it enough. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because you get the picture. This is probably used more often on the phone than it is face to face because on the phone, oftentimes you want to be brief. You don't want to have a big long conversation. So you'll describe something just enough for someone to get the picture. This is a useful phrase to know because it's kind of confusing to English learners. The phrase is brownie points. So if you get brownie points for something, it means you did something good and you're not going to get a real reward for it or you're not going to get more money, a raise in your salary for it. People will just think that you did good. You'll get brownie points for it. So maybe you're very early on a deadline, you did a task for work very quickly, quicker than what was expected of you, 
and your boss says, great job. You can say, yep, I got brownie points for that one. This just means that you got kudos or you got your boss, him or her, to say good job, but you're not getting anything official for the good thing that you did. It's just brownie points. So when we say brownie points, it's an unofficial award for you. When you're working, do you stop right at the time that you are required to work to or do you burn the midnight oil? This phrase, to burn the midnight oil, it means that you work so late, it's like you have to burn extra oil to keep the lights on. Obviously, we don't literally burn oil in our homes or in our workplaces to keep lights on, but this is an old phrase that's used commonly to say that someone works very late. Or if you've been working very late recently, you can say, I've really been burning the midnight oil lately. This just means I've been putting in extra hours at work. This next phrase can be said in two ways to mean two different things. You can tell someone that they are on the hook for something. This means that they are accountable to do it. Or if they make a mistake, let's say they send the wrong number in an email, you can say you're on the hook for that mistake. Or if you want to tell someone that they are not accountable or they are not in charge of that mistake, you can say you're off the hook for that one. That kind of means that you forgive them and that you're not too bothered by their mistake. You're not going to hold it against them. You're not going to tell them that their mistake was really bad. You can say that you're off the hook for that one. This next phrase can be used for bargaining or it can just be in general if you're trying to compromise with someone. So if you are bargaining with someone, let's say they offer you $100 and you want them to pay $200. You can say, can you meet me halfway at $150? If you are working with a coworker, you could say, hey, could you meet me halfway on this one and help me out with it? So it's like, I'm going to help you, but I need you to do a little bit of work. If you tell someone that you need them to meet you halfway, it's like you need them to give you a little bit of something so that you can return a favor or you can you know, give them a deal on a product or whatever you're selling to them. This phrase, meet halfway, is just like compromising. If someone gives you a really bad deal, so maybe they give you a terrible price or a terrible product and they talked about it like you were getting a good deal or a very good product, you can use this phrase, be careful with it, because it could be a tad bit insulting to say that they gave you something bad. You can say that you were sold a bill of goods. This actually sounds like it wouldn't be a bad thing, but it literally means that you were given crap. So you never want to sell someone a bill of goods and you never want to be sold a bill of goods. That means that you got a bad deal or a bad product. If you want to ask someone to be in their schedule and you know they don't have a lot of time, you just need a short meeting, you can ask them to pencil you in. This means if you have a short amount of time, it's like you're writing, you know, your meeting on their calendar very small. You're asking them to pencil you in. This is not a literal phrase, it's figurative. So that just means that can you squeeze in a short meeting in your busy schedule? And oftentimes if we say, can you pencil me in, you're asking very last minute. You're asking very late for a meeting. You didn't schedule it in advance, so you need them to pencil you in. If you need someone to do some math and you need them to figure out the price of something or you need them to figure out how much money is owed and there's lots of different things that are involved in the calculation, Americans will say that they need to crunch the numbers. So you can say, how much is that going to cost? And the person will say, well, I really need to crunch the numbers. Then I can come up with a price. So to crunch numbers means to add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever the calculation requires. And it's used a lot in math too, informally to say, let's figure out the equation. Let's crunch the numbers. This next phrase is super common to see when you are applying for a job. Oftentimes they'll be asking for self-starters. If you describe yourself as a self-starter, this is the same as saying a self-motivator. You don't need a lot of help to figure out how to do a job. 
if you say, I'm, I'm really a self-starter, it means I'm really motivated. I don't need somebody to help me all day. I can figure out what I need to do and I'll do it successfully. So if you're in a job interview, definitely describe yourself as a self-starter because it's a very positive attribute. Here's another idiom that's really frequently used in business. The phrase is to move the goalposts. So this is definitely a sports idiom. It's like in football, there are two goalposts or also in soccer, there are two goalposts and the ball must go through them to score. So in this idiom, whatever the requirement is in business, let's say you have a sales goal. If you reach that goal and then someone says, actually, I need you to sell more to be successful. You can say you're really moving the goalposts on me. It's like they moved the goal so you didn't actually score. You can describe someone or something as a cash cow if it makes you a lot of money. And I would say this is not really a rude phrase, although typically you don't want to call someone a cow in English because it means you're calling them fat usually. But if you say something is a cash cow, like this product I'm selling is really a cash cow, it just means it's made you a lot of money. Or my top salesperson at the company is a cash cow. It means they made a lot of money for you. If you want to ask if information is the latest information, you'll definitely want to say, is this up to date? Does it have all the information for every day leading up to today? So don't say, is this the latest information? Try to say, is this up to date? If you are in a meeting, informally people will just say, do you want to take five? This just means, do you want to take a short break? People will not often say, do you want to take a five minute break? They'll say, do you want to take five? And there's even a candy bar named take five. And this just refers to taking a nice little five minute break. Instead of saying that you need to find some business, you need to find some customers, or you need to find some sales, you'll hear American English speakers say, let's drum up some business let's drum up some customers, or let's drum up some sales. This phrase, to drum up, it means to find. If you're drumming up something, you're, you're bringing it up and you're finding it. It's a very strange phrase to use, but it just means that you have to go look for something. And it's used quite commonly. The most natural idiom to use to say that you need to ask someone that's very knowledgeable some questions is to say that you need to pick their brain. This is a funny phrase and I know that other languages have phrases just like this one that are very strange, but they just mean to ask someone who's very knowledgeable on a subject some questions. So oftentimes students that are studying English will say, hey, can I pick your brain about this phrase? And I'll say, yeah, what do you need help with? Ask me questions. Finally, when you are reaching the end of a workday or the end of a meeting, and someone wants to say that we don't have much time left, that's kind of a mouthful. So usually people will just say, we are running short on time. And if we're not short on time, if we have enough time, you can say, we are okay on time. So people either say we're short on time, which means we don't have enough of it, we're running short, or they can say we are okay on time or we're good on time. This means that we have more than enough time or just enough time to get done what we need to get done in the workday or the meeting. Can you really practice English with no speaking partner? Yes, because in today's lesson, we are going to have three different English conversations that I have written for you that will help you learn natural English phrases. Let's begin. Today's English conversations are all very casual conversations that two coworkers would really have here in the United States. And it's all about an imaginary report that we are going to write. So it's about a written document. And again, you'll learn some really natural natural phrases that I have chosen because I really use these phrases and I know other English speakers from America use these phrases all the time. One thing that will help you in this lesson is if you want a free PDF of our conversation, use the link below and it will be emailed to you so you can read the whole conversation and review some of the natural phrases. Let's get started. I will be role A in today's first conversation. You will be role B and when you hear this sound, 
it means that it's your turn to speak. So you'll be able to read the conversation on the screen. In between our conversations today, I'll explain the natural English phrases so you'll know exactly what we are talking about and you'll have a chance to switch roles and be role A in the conversation as well. Let's get started with conversation number one. Hey, could you help me write this report? Sure, take your time. I'm going to jump right into this one and then you can help. I just hope that I can finish by the end of the day. I need to go home and spend some quality time with my family. Let's talk about some of the natural English phrases that I used in today's lesson. So the first phrase is take your time. When you tell someone to take their time, you say take your time. It's a very polite thing to say that you are patient and you don't want them to rush on account of doing a favor for you. So a very kind way to tell someone that you are patient and they don't need to hurry is to tell them to take their time. I said that I was going to jump into the report that I was writing. When you jump into something, you just start it. You just start going at it. You don't hesitate. So if you jump into a new hobby, it means you just start trying to do it. You don't think about it too much. You just start trying it right away. Now, when you build on somebody's idea or you build on somebody's work, it means that you are either improving it or you are adding on to it. So if you build onto my writing, it means that you'll probably write some new ideas and you'll help me improve the writing as well. The phrase, let's just see what happens or I'll see what happens means that you can't predict the future. So you're just going to wait and see what the outcome is. It's a very common phrase. Let's just see what happens. It just means let's be patient and we will see what the outcome is in the future. A really common way to say that something is going to be difficult or something is difficult for someone is to say it's a struggle. So writing reports is a struggle. It's really difficult. It's hard. A common phrase we use when we talk about spending time with family in a way that's not distracted, you're not looking at your phone, and you're really building a relationship with your family is to say you spend quality time. Quality time is really important, especially between parents and children, in my opinion. Now let's switch roles. I will be role B, you will be role A. Let's get started on the same conversation, but just switched. Yes, I know reports can be a struggle for you. Give me a moment. That sounds good. You start the first draft, then I will build on what you have. Well, get to work and we will see what happens. Great job on conversation number one. You've got two more conversations left today. So let's get started with conversation number two. This conversation will help us share our opinions and learn some great natural phrases for that. Again, I will start with role A and you will be role B. Did you get my email with the report? I hope that I can write it better next time. I'm in this job for the long haul and I don't want to quit. I can see that. There are some really great, useful, natural phrases in this English conversation. You will hear American speakers say, to be honest, all of the time. It's just kind of a formality we add into the way we speak. It's just because you don't say this phrase doesn't mean you're lying. But to say, to be honest, you're just saying I'm being really blunt and I'm not gonna lie to you even though my opinion might be a little offensive or a little harsh. To be honest, your report isn't that great. Or to be honest, there were lots of errors. It's just meaning like, I don't say this to be mean, but I just want to be honest. 
It's just a phrase that Americans add into their conversations all the time. I hear, especially girls from the United States, say this phrase all the time. I didn't love it. Now, if you say you didn't love it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you hated it, but it just means that you didn't like it that much. By saying I didn't love it, it just means that it could have been better. So if someone does something and you want to tell them like, eh, you could have done better, it's okay, I like it, but I didn't love it. The next phrase in this conversation is for the long haul. Again, another common phrase that Americans use to say that they are very committed. If you are in something for the long haul, you are very committed to it. You won't be quitting anytime soon. If you say, I'm not in it for the long haul, it means you're not very committed and you'll probably quit very soon. Another common phrase that I can't really explain why Americans use when they're speaking English, but they use it all the time, is the phrase, don't be silly. When you use the phrase, don't be silly, it just means what you're saying I don't agree with, and you kind of correct them. So if someone says, I'm really bad at writing, you say, don't be silly, you're great. You're saying that I don't agree with you, it's foolish to say that you're bad, don't be silly. It's not meant to be offensive, and it's a really common way to just give someone a compliment or, or contradict what they are saying. A common natural way to agree with someone in English is to say, I can see that. This phrase just simply means I can agree with that. I can see that happening is what it's short for. Someone says to you, you just need to put more work into your writing and you say, I can see that. It just means I agree. I can see myself improving if I do put in more work. I can see that is short for I can see that happening. Nailed it. This is a common phrase. Have you heard it before? Comment down below if you've heard the phrase nailed it before. It means that you did a really good job. We are just going to nail this English conversation. It means we're gonna do really good at it. If you think somebody's actions that they've just done or somebody's work was really good, you tell them nailed it. If you think this English lesson is really good, comment below, you nailed it. Now let's switch roles. I will be role B and you will be role A. Let's keep on practicing. Yes, and to be honest, I didn't love it. Don't be silly, your writing is improving every day. You just have to put more work into your ideas. Let's work on it more together. I think when we're done, we will really nail it. Let's move on to conversation number three. Finally, the imaginary report that we've been working on is complete. Let's finish this third conversation and talk about kind of celebrating a small accomplishment with some more natural English phrases. I will be role A, you will be role B. Let's get started. Thanks a million for the help. I am so happy to be done with the report. I'll remember that next time my report is due. I'm glad you have faith in me. By the way, it's about quitting time. Did you hear some new natural phrases in this third conversation? Let's review some of them. The first phrase that I want to teach you is thanks a million. Now you could say this as thank you a million, but I hear it more commonly said as thanks a million. It just means a million thanks that I am thanking you a lot. If you wanna show that you have a lot of gratitude for someone helping you, you can say thanks a million. Now conversely, if you want to say that it's no problem and that you were very happy to help someone, you can say you are more than welcome. This phrase is the exact same as saying there is no problem, I don't mind helping at all. You are more than welcome. If you tell someone you can handle it, it means that they are competent enough to do the job on their own. So in this lesson, we said you can handle it. It means that 
you are competent. You have got this. If you also want to express confidence in another person, you can say, I have faith in you, meaning I believe in your abilities. And also, if somebody believes in you, you can say, you have faith in me. Having faith means having a belief. In the United States, the end of the workday is also known as quitting time. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean you're going to quit your job at that time. It just means that you're done working for the day. Do you have a phrase like quitting time in your native language? I would want to know in the comments as well. There are two ways to use the phrase chill out. You can say it as a command. You can tell someone chill out. That means relax. Or you can say I'm going to just chill out and that means I'm going to relax and it has a more positive association. If you tell someone to chill out it can be a bit negative. It can be a bit offensive like Anytime you tell someone to relax, it doesn't actually make them relax, funny enough. So in this conversation, we said, that's what I need after a long day. It just says that relaxing is going to really be satisfying after a hard work day. You can also say this phrase sarcastically and you can say, that's just what I need or that's just what I needed if it's something that you didn't actually need. Try this phrase out in a conversation if you want to be sarcastic and someone tells you that they're going to do something that you don't need at all, that you don't want to happen. Okay, my friend, we are going to switch roles one last time. I'll be role B, you be role A, and we will finish this lesson with our final conversation. You are more than welcome. I am always here when you need me. I think that you can handle it next time. Yes, now I can go home and chill out. That is what I need after a long day.